I am Chris Carpenter, better known as Chris Rex, and for the last nine years I have been traveling up and down the roads as an independent professional wrestler. I have had the opportunity to train, work with, and share locker rooms with some of the best to ever step foot inside the squared circle. My co-host is Alex Alcazaz, aka the Bear of Texas. A journalist born outside of Lyon, France, he moved to the United States at the age of four and his love of sports is what led him to become a sports writer. And with seven years under his belt already, the sky is the limit for this young Texan. Together, we mix my knowledge and professional experience with his research and sports journalism to bring you a unique view on Vice TV's hit series, Dark Side of the Ring. This is Dark Side of the Podcast. Dino Bravo was a professional wrestler and booker who during the 1980s was so popular, he was dubbed the Hulk Hogan of Montreal. Standing at 6 foot 1, weighing 265 pounds, Dino Bravo seemed like a shoe-in for Vince McMahon's World Wrestling Federation at the time, who were signing the top talent in Montreal to financially satisfying contracts. Ultimately, Dino Bravo would join the WWF but he would not reach the on-screen success that he envisioned for himself. In 1992, after seven years with the World Wrestling Federation, Dino Bravo was released from his contract. With no other means of making an in income, he turned to the life of crime, and on March 10, 1993, he was found dead. He had been shot 11 times, and he was murdered by an unknown assailant at his home in Montreal while watching hockey. 27 years later, the case is a bizarre mystery and remains un solved. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Alex Alcazaz, a.k.a. The Bear of Texas, and I am here with pro wrestler and current Infinite Pro Wrestling Fury TV champion Chris Rex, and tonight we discuss the assassination of Dino Bravo. Chris, this ride just got bigger. It seems like every episode we're saying that, man, but it's true. Um, I was... It, this was definitely right. Like, it was so many twists and turns. Like, how uh, we talked about last week, where how I kind of try to piece piece the, the puzzle pieces together, you know, and try to figure out the story myself. Every time I thought I, I kind of had an idea of what was going on, you come back from commercial break, and boom, it's another twist. And it, it was just, wow, man. Like, I knew um, that Dino Bravo had been murdered. Um but again, I was uh, I wasn't even a thought when he was wrestling, and I was only about three years old, not even three years old when he had passed away. So all I had known really is that Dino Bravo were, was murdered. Now that I watch this episode and I see everything that had gone into it, oh man, I'm like, whoa! Like we really don't know uh, these, these guys' lives um, behind closed doors, man. We don't. And, how, and, and and what a major understatement that is, the fact that we do not know what's happening in, their, in the wrestlers' lives outside of the ring. It's just, the whole series is a mystery after mystery after mystery. That's why this may be the best wrestling documentary series ever, and I don't think anything's ever going to top it. So let's get right to it. So Dino Bravo was uh, born, uh, he was actually born in Italy, he was, uh, grew up in Canada. Um, as you said, uh, he dubbed as the Hulk Hogan of, uh, of Montreal, and it's just amazing, because we learned how wrestling was, you know, wrestling was a huge thing in Canada, and, and in Montreal, Montreal might have been the most popular spot in wrestling in the, in the country of Canada. Oh yeah, definitely, uh, the stars that came out of Montreal, I mean, before they went to WWF, you had Andre the Giant, you had Roddy Piper, you had Dino Bravo, I mean, it's a who's who of... of 80s professional wrestling, 80s WWF, WrestleMania, people that have been in multiple WrestleManias, and they came from Montreal. That that was the big territory at the time. I mean, the list also goes on. You know, there was the Mountie. Uh, the <laughs> and uh, there was also um, Haku. Well, Haku, uh, he, by the time I think he was known as, uh, he was known as King Tonga, I believe, during, during his uh, tenure in Montreal. He was also wrestling there. And uh, there was Rick Martel uh, as, as well. Uh, who turned yeah. out to be the model? We were, that's how I remember him as the model, and uh, also uh, you know uh, Jacques Rougeau's brother, uh, who's Jacques Rougeau by the way is the Mountie y'all, and his brother uh, Raymond I believe uh, they were the the, the Rougeau brothers. I mean, 
they all start in that in that territory and and, and yeah. part of the story we'll, it's going to show like it's the rise and fall of a promotion in Canada that was known as International Wrestling and it was based in Montreal. I just want to put this out there that the family was interviewed um, for for this uh, episode and this is the first time they had spoken about the tragedy since. So I, I really have to applaud the family for um, being open and, and honest and, and the strength to, to talk about this, you know, even if it's 27 years later, you know, um, I'm sure they, that whole family was devastated. So to, for them to actually be like, you know what, I, it, it's time to, to let this go, you know, and, and let this out. It needs to be, it's a story that needs to be heard. It, it is. And, and I'm going to let you keep going in a second, but yeah, it's amazing that, I mean, I'm amazed that they were, they were able to convince the family to talk about it. Uh, but but like like you just said, I mean they have to let it go, and you know I think honestly, I mean I didn't know who Dino Bravo was. To be. I mean I'm being 100% honest. I mean this may not be cool to say, but I had no idea who he was until I saw this documentary, or at least uh, at least until I heard about this episode. I knew Dino Bravo, but in, in, uh, from the tapes that I used to watch as a kid, it was he was never that top star. So for me, it really he. I knew who he was, but he, you know, he wasn't Ultimate Warrior. He wasn't Randy Savage. He wasn't Roddy Piper. You know, he, you know, he was kind of that mid card guy. So we start off this episode and we meet his daughter Claudia, um, and you know she's looking at pictures in a photo album. And uh, this episode, uh, it, it, a lot of French. There's a lot of French, so it's very subtitled, and um, yeah. which I, which I had fun kind of learning a few words. I'm like, wow, it's not that, not that far off from English, you know? Well, for me, it was difficult because they're not speaking the French that, that I'm used to speaking. They're speaking with the uh, with the French-Canadian Canadian. dialect. Uh, we, we call it uh, Quebecois. Uh, but, I mean, some of the words, I mean, it was a bit accurate based on how I would say. But, yeah, it was hard for me to understand some of them because those accents, and then they speak their version of French, it's very, very difficult. To, it's very difficult for me to even grasp. And, and, I'm, and I'm a Frenchman myself. <laughs> yeah, that, well, that's why I wanted to bring that up. I wanted to get your opinion on that. Um, I mean, they, so, were, they were speaking the, the way they speak, and, and I respect it. I'm sure they, res- they would respect the way I speak. But the bottom line is they were speaking French. I mean, because in every, wherever French is spoken, all the dialects, the grammar, whatever, it's, they're all different. They're all tweaked. So it's nothing new that well, they're speaking a bit differently. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure that's with, with, with any language, too. Oh, but yes. moving on, uh, Dino Bravo well, was his wrestling name. His real name was Adolfo Bresciano. I believe I said that, right? Yes. Um, and uh, he met uh, his wife, Diane Rivest. Okay, they met in a bar, and she fell in love with him. She was 19 at the time, mm-hmm. and he had offered to drive her home. And pretty much that's how their love story started. And then we meet a uh, pro wrestling historian, Patrick Laprade. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think I'm saying that right. Yeah, and he works for WWE. Uh, I think he's the French uh, commentary guy for WWE. Oh, wow. I, I didn't even notice that. He he talks starts talking about how Dino was um, a superhero to him. You know, um, he was the star of like you said earlier the uh, international wrestling based out of Montreal. It was the top promotion in Quebec. There was about two million people that tuned in every week to watch. I mean, that's <laughs> that's amazing on, at, on a Saturday morning today. too, which which really surprised me. One of the guys mentioned, yeah, I think it was on a Saturday or Sunday morning. So I was like, huh. They have the shows in the morning. That's that's usually something you don't see uh, very often, especially in wrestling. Uh, the promoter of international wrestling um, was Tony Mule from 1971 to 1986. Another man by the name of Gino Brito was uh, another promoter, and he he and Dino became pretty much best friends. Um, they were like family together, and Dino was the top draw in international wrestling. Oh, yeah. And he definitely had, you know, the the promoter by his side, which, you know, Dino wound up becoming the matchmaker. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just the which, matchmaker. I mean, he was he was everything. I mean, he was all, he was also the owner uh, from 1982 to 86. Yeah. And he and was and he was the, the top guy. But, yeah, he was everything. But I want to what I want to explain here is um, how in wrestling there's see that's kind. Of, Kind of looked at as as kind of a, a negative thing. It's kind of a bad look when you know you're the owner, you're the promoter, you're the matchmaker, and you're the top guy. You're working the main event. You're working all the top guys. It kind of puts a label on you. It's kind of like, hey, I own this, and I'm doing this, and I'm winning every match. You know, it's so in pro wrestling, especially you know, like nowadays, it, it still happens. It, it kind of uh, 
already kind of puts a bad look to you to the outside world. Mm-hmm. Maybe in your promotion, everyone understands, you know, that this is how the business is. You know, this is how your business is done. But, you know, maybe uh, guys from the WWF or, or other Canadian promotions would could probably look at that and say, hey, this guy's the star of his own show here. It is, and... Um... The Mountie sp- spoke about it, and, and he said, you know, I didn't like that. You know, I wanted to be, you know, I, I wanted to be uh, the boss, but, and uh, Jacques Rougeau explained, you know, even though he's, he he says that his brother were always like the third or the fourth match into the card, he said, well, it doesn't matter where I was, because I knew that I myself was a main eventer. So, even though he was not really happy with how things were going, I think he was just swallowing his pride, and, you know, just working, doing as he was told, because he wanted to build his career, because he knew that opportunities would come for him in the future because Rougeau was a young, uh, he said he was young when he met Dino Bravo. He said he was 18 years old. Yes, he was 18 years old. I mean, it, being 18 years old, if you're not listening to Dino Bravo, I mean, that, that would probably be an easy way to kill your career. Yeah, it, it could. But again, it's also that, that kind of, that thought of who's get, who can, who else can be the top guy if, if you're the only, only top guy, you know? Mm-hmm. So I kind of, I kind of see it from, at, from a wrestler's perspective of, <laughs> Okay, I see it. You know, you're the top guy. We're we're all the B players, but how does anyone advance if you don't let anyone become the top guy? If you don't if you don't pass that torch, if you don't let guys come up, you know, and show you what they can do and earn that top spot. And it, it seems to me like when you were speaking about how it makes him look bad, I think part of the point is you're also trying to explain that when you're doing that to your talent, like you're holding them back. Yeah, I mean, you, you some talent will feel like you're holding them back, and some will just feel like, "Why am I here?" Then you know, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm getting paid, but if I'm you know, who, everyone when you get in this business, no one gets in this business to say, "I want to be a jobber," "I want to be a mid carter." No one gets in this business. Everyone wants to be a star. That's why we get in this business. You want to be famous. You want a star. You want the spotlight. You want the main event. You want WrestleMania. You want Wrestle Kingdom. You, you know. Uh, that's why you get in this. So, of course, uh, no matter who's in L.A., they're going to they're gonna have that, whether they admit it or not, they're going to have that feeling of, I want to be in that main event spot. Uh, what do I have to do? How much more do I have to work to prove to you that I need to be in that main event spot? If You, uh, uh, you know, give me the ball and I'll run with it. And, yeah, maybe not all the locker room was ready to be in, in, in a top spot, but I'm sure there were guys. I mean, you don't run a promotion without building guys. You have to build guys. That's the only way a promotion becomes successful and, and can continue on is if you keep building new stars and building new stars. So I, I, I can definitely see uh, the maybe a disruption in a locker room because of that. And, you know, they, they never really kind of said that in the documentary, but I felt like it, it was implied that that kind of might have been the feeling amongst some people in the locker room. Mm-hmm. And then we got to the uh, point where uh, Jacques Rougeau, uh, I mean, it, it says uh, that he, he he that Vince McMahon and Pat Patterson, Pat Patterson was another famous wrestler from uh, Montreal. Um, they called him and they said, uh, Jacques, do you want to do you want to come to the World Wrestling Federation? And and Jacques explains that you know I don't know because he 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 described it like it's a jungle, like because the, the, the World Wrestling Federation is a was just beginning to become a huge major global attraction. And him being young, he was like, you know what, I'm going to the jungle by myself. I don't know if I should do it. But then again, I mean, the the money is good. The opportunities are there. Maybe maybe I should do it. And that's why. And, and therefore, you know, and you know, he even mentions that uh, Dino Bravo begged him not to do it. Yeah, but uh, I and you you, I can see Dino Bravo's uh, point as like, man, like I don't want to lose you, but. You know, if you're not going to give me uh, a bigger opportunity than what I'm doing right now, if I'm just going to be stuck here on third match, fourth match, and I want to be seventh match eventually, and I don't see that happening here, then I have to do what's best for my career and make more money for my family. Mm-hmm. Which I'm sure he was 18. He Maybe he didn't have a family, but you still have to, you still have to make money. You still have to, you know go out and, and seek these opportunities because if he would have just stayed in Montreal, um, who knows? Like maybe he would have just felt like he was wasting his time. Mm-hmm. So he had to make that. Jump. 
So you was had it- to. And a lot of other guys, like we said, a lot of other guys were making that jump for the fact that they were being offered big money. And I can see that. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're going to offer me a, a better lifestyle, then oh, by all means, you know, I'll at least give it a try. You know? Yeah. So before we go to the part where he had to jump ship, uh, we should mention the fact that um, he had an early stint with it. He had two stints with the, with the World Wrestling Federation. Now, the first one did not last long. So they bring him in, and there was a huge tease, and this really, really blew me out of the water. So they, they were teasing a match to have Dino Bravo versus Hulk Hogan, and one of the dudes said that if they had done that in the Montreal Olympic Stadium, my God, like that would have been a – I mean, I can't imagine how many fans would – would have showed up. That event probably would have sold out in probably, I would have, probably in ten minutes. It How- definitely would have sold out. Um, you know, uh, and I can definitely feel for Dino Bravo here because it's like he was at Top Star in Montreal, but Vince knew that if they went to Montreal and they put him against Hulk Hogan, Hulk Hogan probably would have not been the baby face. You know, uh, Dino Bravo would have been the 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 face. He would have been the hero. And at that time, Hulk Hogan is the hero. Mm-hmm. He's your top, you know. So I, I it would have been bad for Hulk Hogan. And, 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 and bad for the left. WWF, yeah. Yes. Although, yeah. although, but let's be honest. I mean, I mean, seriously, Dino Bravo is a is a he's not just a hero in Montreal. He was a god. So it's, it's honestly it's common sense. I mean, of course, I mean the Montreal fans that they're going to cheer for Dino Bravo See, over Hulk where, Hogan. But yeah, but that's that's where this whole. Uh, this whole ego thing comes into play because, and it, and it, you, there's a pattern of it throughout all wrestling. Is why so many big matches, so many dream matches, never happened, and it's because of ego. Because no one wants to say, "Hey, I will lose to you," or no one wants to say, uh, "You know, um, oh, I don't mind putting you over." You know, you know, and it really that's where that delusion starts. Because at the end of the day, if you're making money, if you're ma- if I'm about to make the biggest payday of my life. And I, I'm Hulk Hogan, okay? I'm about to work, make a big-ass payday in Montreal, Canada, working against their top guy. Screw it. Because at the end of the day, this, this is predetermined. You know, um, it's, it's not fake, but it's not real. You know, you're not, you're, not the, uh, you're not Hulk Hogan in real life, you know? I'm not Hulk Hogan. I'm not a Chris Rex in, in real life, you know? So... You, you, if you just, if people would just put that ego aside, we could have had a lot of, we could have had that Dino Bravo match. I'm sure Dino Bravo didn't want to lose to Hogan, and I'm sure Hogan didn't want to lose to Dino Bravo. Kind of like how we were talking about um, with our previous episode with Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart. They didn't want to put each other over. The match, um, the Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, WrestleMania match that never happened because Ric Flair didn't want to put Hulk Hogan over. Hulk Hogan didn't want to put Ric Flair over. I mean, <laughs> They, what it comes down to is two guys who believe in their character so much that they can't. They feel they cannot lose. But wait, think about the money you're gonna make. I just, I okay. love you. Okay. Took, you took this explanation by my, storm. I mean, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say, lay me on my back and pay me a million dollars. I will not complain. Pin me, pay me. You killed it, man. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, who the hell cares? I mean, if, if you're going to make good money, if the match is going to be viewed by millions around the world, who the hell cares if you win or lose? I mean, it's predetermined. You should know that. I mean, that's the first thing you know about the business. And and, and I'm amazed that e- the word ego wasn't even mentioned in that part of the documentary because obviously people are going to say, nah. I mean, if people are, are just going to take a side. They're not going to say it like we do. I mean, it's obvious that there was an ego involved. So, as a result of, of the job, matching being canceled... Our job on this podcast is not to pick a side, though. What is it? What is it, Alex? What is our job here? Oh, well, let me tell you, uh, very crystal clear. Tell the truth, the whole truth, and God damn it, nothing but the truth. That's it. We're That's not it. here to pick sides. No. Nope. And, you know, in this situation here, it, it's clear that <laughs> egos got in the way, and it prevented big money from being made. I mean, this and, is and that, another big what if. That's that. Another huge that, what if in the history of wrestling, and that was his first. That was his, you know, first little stint with, with WWE uh, and uh, WWF at the time. And unfortunately, it it didn't really amount to anything. And uh, you know, he went back to international wrestling. Mm-hmm. You know, he went back to what he knew. 
Uh, but yeah, if they would have sold that Olympic Stadium, man, man. What's up? How's it going? You already know my voice. You know who I am. This is Donna the Playmaker Song from the Playmaker's Pod Podcast. And you know, I just want to take some time and talk about Anchor FM as we've been using Anchor FM for over two years now. And it's been very good to us. It's been very great for us. So for those of you who are trying to get into the podcast world and you need a hosting platform and you don't have the budget and you want to do something free just to try it out and see where you at, try Anchor FM. Anchor is the one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing your podcast. Best of all, it's 100% free and ridiculously easy to use. And now, Anchor can match you with great sponsors who want to advertise on your podcast. That means you can get paid right away. So when you hear this, you know, it sounds good enough. But give it, I'm telling you right now, give it a shot. Anchor FM, by it being free, it gives you opportunity to step into the podcasting world and let you do your own thing. So if you want to give it a shot and you want to try to make some money or just do podcasting as a hobby, go to anchorfm.com slash start to get started right away. And remember, once you get started, hit us up at the Playmakers Bar so we can listen to you at the show. Good luck. Now we get into where Vince McMahon is starting to come into uh, Montreal, and he's starting to, you know, take the top talent, like you said, the Rick Martels, the Andre, the Giants, the uh, the Mountie, the the Hakus, or, yeah, uh, King Tonga at the time. <laughs> I prefer Haku, <laughs> but um, <laughs> or Meng. <laughs> so, so because because you know he felt so disrespected and that that this big match didn't happen. He decided that he was going to become, and uh, this is where that bitterness comes in. And you see it a lot in professional wrestling where it's screw Vince, Vince is the devil, Vince is the, which yes, he may do some, make some bad decisions, you know, but when you try to go up against Vince, when you try to be Vince's competition, and, and I hope uh, wrestlers and promoters nowadays are listening to this right now, this piece right here, you cannot just wake up one day and you're going to take on Vince. You cannot just wake up one day and have an an investor and you're going to take on Vince. Vince has been building this company for years. Vince's father, Vince's grandfather has been building this company for ages. There is no way that in a year, two years, three years, you're going to take out Vince McMahon. I mean, you just can't do it. You're not. You're, it's, it's, you're not. And I, and I get the whole revolution thing, and I get the whole – and uh, it's clear that I'm talking about AEW here, and I mean no disrespect by it. But you have to kind of stay in your own ground. Um, and I don't mean to get off, off topic here, but it's kind of like with TNA when they tried to go head-to-head with Monday night – with Monday night – on Monday nights against Raw. Uh, pfft, you can't you, – no matter how much talent you have, how much money you have, you have to understand that Vince – is a staple you know he's a world it's a worldwide media conglomerate it is not just a wrestling company they are so much more than that so if you want to compete with vince you have to compete compete with his production you have to compete with his, his talent you have to compete with his work rate and uh i mean you got to give it to him and for bravo to out of bitterness, and this is why, again, I'm, I don't mean to speak bad on on uh, a dead man, but it was clearly out of bitterness that he wanted to make his promotion competition to WWF, which, hey, you know, you kind of need, need an influence to do that, but I really think his chances of doing that were doomed from the start, and he obviously had no, no chance he had because no chance in hell. He really, he really <laughs> didn't. And I don't mean to laugh at that, but you know, but going up, going up to, like you said, I mean, you want to, you think you, you're just going to compete with Vince, and, and, and things are going in your favor. I mean, you're out of your mind. I mean, Vince has been everybody. I mean, learn a lesson from Ted Turner, from Eric Bischoff, from Paul Heyman, from everybody. Vince will take you down one way or the other. You just can't beat him. Vince has been doing this for decades. I mean, like you said, his father, his grandfather, WWE is just. It's, it's. I mean, I. I don't know if I should say untouchable because honestly, we all we've all heard the term. Nobody's untouchable, but it seems like WWE is just untouchable. And you're right. It is bitterness. 
But now that we get to the we we get to a point where his his uh, international wrestling is uh, on life. You know, as I described, it's on life support. It's pretty much on life support. Yeah, there's all the talent's been gone. Like Vince McMahon took that talent away, and now and now Vince calls him. Uh, he invites Dino Bravo over, and he says, "Look, let's forget the past. I'll gi- I'll, I'll give you a, a contract. I'll pay you well. Just come work with me. We, we can we can do business together." And Bravo had no choice because he needed to provide for his family. Of it's, course. So as much as much as you want you want your promotion to succeed, the reality is is if all your top stars are gone and you're you're not going to make that money, you're not going to get that draw. I mean, it's the obvious choice. And he could have I he could have continued that fight and it would have been a it would have been a losing battle. You know, uh, it's either go out as a martyr or try to be a martyr. Uh, or, you know what? Let's let's just kind of do the smart thing for for my family because at this point it's not about wrestling; it's about taking care of my wife, taking care of my family, mm-hmm. providing a home. You know. And you know, I, I had a couple of people tell me um, they were surprised that Vince was not like, you know what? You didn't want it, you wanted to compete. I mean, I'm not gonna hire you, but look, Vince is the kind of guy. Look, Vince wants to do business. Vince is willing to let go of the past because you know he wants. He wants everything to work out on both sides. I mean, he wants to build his business and you know get some talent up, and then the and then Bravo needs to make my money to provide for his family. But here's something I really have to say: when Dino Bravo signed with the WWF in 1986, he stepped into a world that he was not familiar with, and I will explain why. And, and this is and we're gonna explain. And this is gonna go as in, in this part in the in this part of, of, of the episode, because as Chris mentioned earlier, folks. When Bravo was running his promotion, he was everything. The booker, the, the guy who made the storylines, you know, the owner, the top guy. When he went to the WWF, he had no control of anything whatsoever. No, and like you said previously, like uh, the Mountie said, uh, it, it's a jungle out there. It's a whole different world. And, yeah, he, I mean, he was making good money. Uh, he was, when he signed, he was offered 300000 guaranteed. Was it a year? With, Do we know if it's per year? Um, I, I I don't know if it was um per year or if it was a total sum, but he was offered three hundred thousand guaranteed with a chance to make up to a million. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um. And hey, you know, but at that time, at once you sign that contract, you have to understand that you are now uh, a character for Vince McMahon. Just like the Mountie you know, explains, that, that's, and that, and that goes still goes on today. Mm-hmm. And um, you know where it's kind of like you sign that contract, you have to understand that you are now a product of the WWE. Mm-hmm. You know, um, your social media is under speculation. You know what you wear, what you do. I mean, it's all under speculation, and it's uh, you're under this microscope, and you have to understand that you're not going to be that top guy right away. You're, you know, you. To Vince McMahon, what you everything you accomplished before you got there, I don't want to say doesn't matter, but it kind of doesn't matter because here is the global stage. You know, here is where the millions and millions and millions of people are here to see you, rather than the thousands and thousands. I mean, you're traveling around. You're not just traveling like in the sections of the U.S. Like you're not just in the South or in the Northwest. I mean, you're all over the country. You're all over the world, and 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 you're traveling probably t- three times more than you were before. I mean, you're on the road between 250 to 300 days a year. Huh. I mean, that's brutal. And just like the way you explained, it's just like the Mountie explained. It's a jungle, but once you sign that contract, you're not. You have no control. Like you belong to the WWF. Like you have to. Whatever they give you, you have to do it. I feel like it's no different than a nine to five job. You go into there, you do what your boss tells you to do, whether you want to, whether you want to do it, whether you like to do it, whether you like your boss, whether you hate your boss, you do what, you, what you're what you asked to do, and you go home, and at the end of the week, you get your paycheck. Mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, if, if and I, I, I think wrestlers should think of it that way. Really put that, forget about this, this, uh, this self-mark stuff that we do to ourselves this oh i'm chris rex i'm no oh, chris rex is just a name chris rex is, is chris rex is whatever i want him to be in that ring you know it 
it's not this big deal where I, you know, I'm, I think I'm this, should be on this pedestal. You know, we, we think we're bigger and we're larger than life when really majority of us aren't, you know? <laughs> All right. So, so the first thing with a character is, um, Vince does not want him to be a big, a, a huge baby face. So he, what he has him do is he has him bleach his hair blonde and he turns him into a big anti-American Canadian wrestler. Yeah, and uh, it's funny because uh, with, with Vince like uh, saying uh, he had to dye his hair, Dino Bravo was like he didn't want to do it, you know, but he understood it's it's what he was asked to do and he's going to do it. And he didn't like when he came into the locker room and all the guys were ribbing him and laughing at him. Like he really did not like it because he felt like it was a joke to him. You know, he was being treated as a joke. And um, I've heard personal stories of uh you know where where guys have been in the wwe and they're told you know uh we want you to look like this and you go and do that and it's like oh now i want you to look like this so you go and do that and they're like oh, we liked how you looked before so now you got to revert back but now by the time you come back to them for another tryout they're now looking for something else and it's uh, you know and it's kind of like a test um, I, I had a friend who was working for a company where they made him shave, shave, uh, shave his head, um, and for for a new gimmick and everything like that. So he did. He shaved, cut his hair, and he then he was told that he was just told that to see um, if he was willing to do what was ever asked of him. I mean, it's just like you know, as we explained earlier, he w- those he had no control over anything like. He was property of the World Wrestling Federation, basically. That's why there's a term, like, when a wrestler is, like, laid off from WWE, that's why they say he's released from his contract, because he's he's free. He's set free. Like, he can go yeah. back He can go back on the indie scene and, and do uh, do whatever he wants. Like, he can he can reprise his old, char- his old character name, whatever, if he has a trademark on, on his indie name, he can immediately revert, revert back to it and do, you know, do what he does with, with more freedom. That's That's how it is. So, but unfortunately, I mean, his run in the WWF was, you know, well, they put they put him, they wanted him to be a heel. They had mm-hmm. him dye his hair, and they put him with Jimmy Talk, who is one of the best managers. He's the best talker, and you know, I think that uh, that was a good pairing to kind of solidify him as a heel. You know, mm-hmm. you got this heel manager coming out with this guy. Automatically, you know, he's a heel. Uh, but Dino's downfall was his broken English. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it was hard for him to, for fans to get, uh, understand his promos or what he was saying. Um, and this is when I seen this part uh, last night. I, I went to my partner and I said, why would they have him talk then? You know, like that's what Jimmy is there for. That's what the manager is there for. You usually put a manager with, with somebody that, doesn't have that charisma because if they have that charisma, they don't need a manager, you know. Exactly. Um, so I, I think they should have just had Jimmy talk to him. But hey, I'm not. I'm not. I wasn't a writer at that time. I nor am I a writer for WWE now. But he another one of his downfalls was he didn't like doing jobs, and he was beat every week after week, and he felt that that was taking away from his stock as a, as a professional wrestler. You know, um, that if fans are seeing you every week on TV lose, well, they're never going to expect you to win. They're never, they're never, they're not going to think of you. You're just that guy that lost, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so, and it would hurt his value, which, um, I I can see that, but at the end of the day, it's, you're a product of the WWE. So if that's what they kind of want you to do. That's what they're going to do with you, you know, um, and you see it happening to, in, in today's WWE where a lot of people are unhappy that with the position that they're in. But again, you, you're you're contracted to them, you know, you kind of it's kind of like you, you know, these things going in. Nobody signs a WWE contract thinking, oh, they're, they're going to let me do whatever I want. I'm going to be so free to do whatever I want. No one signs a contract thinking that. 
So you can't sign that contract thinking you're going to be this top star. You're going to be on the pedestal that fans put you on when you were on the indies working in front of 2,000 people, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and that's how Vince sees it as, okay, you're coming from working in front of a few thousand people to tens and thou- tens and 20,000 people and 40,000 people, 70,000 people, you know. It's kind of, yes, WWE is the big stage. If you go up to anybody and, and ask them about wrestling, nine times out of ten, they're going to bring up WWE. Exactly. Why? It's the main, it's what people know. You know, I'm sure, and again, I love Adam Cole. He, I think he's a, he's a great performer. Um, but when he gets signed to uh, WWE and they're putting him on TV, they still have to build him up to the, to the WWE audience. Because the WWE, not all of the WWE audience knows there's even an Indies. They, they don't know there's even shows in their town. You know, it's, it, they don't know this guy. And you have to, you, that's where that ego comes in, where you kind of, you can't have that ego. And Dino had that ego of, he was so used to being a top guy in, in Montreal that now he's here and he's being told what to do. And he's got that ego of, I, I should be the top guy. I should be the top guy. And I get, I get, I get that you feel it's going to hurt your value. But it's not hurting your value because you're still getting paid. Regardless, you're getting paid whether you win or lose. You're getting paid whether you're third or fourth. You're getting paid whether you're in a tag match, whether you're in a singles match, when you're in a title match, whether you're working Hulk Hogan or whether you're working Rick Martel. It, you're still getting paid. So your value, there's a value dropping. I kind of don't. I kind of don't uh, agree with the whole that drops your value, your your character, your your it, it, that wasn't you know that was Dino Bravo the character, okay that was not Adolfo Bresciano. They're not going on there on, on TV and saying uh, uh, I'm putting Adolfo out there. No, it's Dino Bravo. It's a character. It's like being and, a, it's like being a character in a film. <laughs> It's kind of like it's that whole believe in your own hype thing. And yeah. um, it's something that uh, my trainer had taught me is don't believe in your own hype. This is because outside this world of wrestling, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter outside this world of wrestling outside. You know, when you're away from that ring, when when you're home, it, that the belt doesn't matter. What, what you did on TV doesn't matter. The match you had doesn't matter. Who you work doesn't matter. It really doesn't. So, for him to have that ad, that that attitude and that um, that ego, I think that's really what really killed him. I think if he would have kind of came at it from more of a, you know what, I'm here to do my job. My family's being taken care of. I'm able to live this lavish lifestyle that I've wanted to live and that I have already put on myself because that's something they did bring up is that when he signed with WWF, he started spending a lot of money. And he had his house built and, you know, built from scratch, which I'm sure that took a lot of guap, you know. So you can't really sit there and, and, and uh, say it's not benefiting you or that your value is going down. I mean, I don't know a lot of people that have um, their own houses being built, you know. You're, 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 so you're, you're living, you're, he's providing you with, with, and your family with a lifestyle that, if he did not get off you this contract, you you wouldn't have this lifestyle. Mm-hmm. I mean, in other words, Vin, it's not like Vince controls your finances. It's not like Vince can tell you, yeah, don't you can't buy this, you can't do that. I mean, that's a choice Dino made. So if Dino was like spending all that money, I mean, that's his fault. Vince just gave him the opportunity to you know provide for his family. So that's why Vince can't be blamed. But yeah, but that, you talking about your the ego? God damn it, man! You're absolutely right. Yeah. I mean. I- and, uh, you know, um, after seven years, you know, uh, in 1992, uh, he was released from his contract. And he seemed to, from what um, the Mountie had said, he seemed to be relieved. You know, he's like, I'm, I'm going home. I'm released. I'm going home. I'm going to go be free. Which, you know, I, I'm, you know, happy, you know, because... I'm sure being on the road and having all that on your mind did weigh on him. So for him to finally be like, you know what? I don't have to put up with this anymore. You know, it's kind of um, a weight off your shoulders. You know, he's no longer feel he he's no longer stuck. You know, but 
all he knew was wrestling. That's all he did. And um, when his contract expired, he he was burnt out. You know, um, there, there's no pension. There's no money coming in. And you're sitting at home sulking in your own sorrow because your career is that is winding down. You're losing your the, the one thing that pretty much gave you everything and the only job you, you had. For as long as you can remember, this is the only job you've had, and now it's over. What do you do? And I can kind of, uh, I can kind of feel that, you know. Um, it's it's you you hear that story a lot where where wrestlers, it's like when their run is up, it there is no pension, there's no retirement, there's nothing to fall back on. Hopefully, you you saved enough money to where you 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 can fall back. You know, you have something to fall back on. But a lot of times, it's not that case. You know, because you don't, you don't, you don't know when your ride is over. You don't know when, when, when that uh, fame is over. You, you don't know. You never. So you just have. You kind of spend it while you have it. You, you're out there and you're enjoying the life while you can. You don't know when. You don't expect it to come to an end. And when it does, I feel, I really feel bad for for a lot of a lot of guys because it's, what what do you do? Do you go work in the supermarket and have everybody there looking at you like, oh, that guy was on TV two years ago? Well, what's he doing working in key food? You know, um, I, I really feel for those. And it, mm-hmm. it's kind of like it makes me think because I kind of put all my eggs in the wrestling basket. You know, um, I never really kind of wanted to go to college or anything like that. Um, so I dropped out like after half a semester. I was like, you know, I sold my books back. And so it's kind of I've been chasing this wrestling thing, you know. Um, but I, there's a lot of times where I think if. You know, got you know if when it's over, what I don't have anything else really. You know, I uh, I'm smart. You know, I, I I can do manual labor. I know things. You know, but as far as a career, what do I do? You know, and so I I try to put myself in his shoes, and and I can see like there is only one way to turn. And unfortunately, that's where we get into the the next part of this episode. This is professional wrestler Chris Rex, and you're listening to the Playmakers Blog Podcast, my only destination for sports talk radio. You you kind of turn to the only way you can get money, and um, and the amount of money to support your family, uh, turn to a life of crime. Uh huh. And you know what? And uh, and before we get into that, um, what's really interesting is that he was a he was a nephew. Of a Montreal crime boss who was known as Vic Catrani, who was uh, known as the Egg, and he was believed by authorities to be involved in, in organization in the organization organization for some time. Um, it says that he was involved, uh, like part of his role was in an I- illegal cigarette smuggling case. The whole thing is just interesting because, like you mentioned, when you're done wrestling, there's no other life there for you, and you you're desperate to keep the family afloat, and you got to make money. Th- in a good possible way. Yeah, and we're not talking about no two hundred dollar paycheck. Like he has to now keep up with this lifestyle he has built for his family. Mm-hmm. So, so if for anyone out there that's listening, oh, he should have just went and got a job. It's not like it's not that it's simple. Not like it's not that simple. He needs he needs a he had a career that that is now taken from him. That is gone. He needs to supply his family with that type of money. And unfortunately, in this world. There's only a, a couple places you can go for that, and one of those is, is the is the the life of crime, the the uh, you know the smuggling and 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 the drug dealing and and the, the quick money, the fast money, because that that's what you need. It's just it's just what a world out so there. I, for I, I, I just, just want to point out that it's not like he 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 didn't want to go get it. It's like you can't just go go to work at a at a supermarket, you can't just go to work at a bicycle shop, or you can't just do that. You know, it's a it, it, part of its pride, and a, and like I said, another part of it is you have to maintain this lifestyle now mm-hmm. that's already that you've already built. And yes, he was the the nephew of uh, Vic Catroni, which uh, they were they, that I believe that family was the first um, mafia family in uh, in in. Quebec in Montreal, mm-hmm. and 
he he you know he was he was his nephew so we kind of he always had that that connection there um but um was he a part of the uh the mafia was was he an an official member that's the mystery that's kind of start that start that we start to develop here is what was he part of it or was he just kind of involved because he was family was he asked to do things because he was family yeah, it because was never that- confirmed it was never confirmed if he was an official member it's it's just that you know um based on, on my friend of mine who's a who's a criminal justice major and uh, he's explained this before like just because you do jobs to the mafia it does not mean that you're fully associated with it it's because like if you're connected like that and if they offer you to do just this thing and they pay you some people just do it but that doesn't it, mean it, that, that you're fish. It doesn't mean that you're made man. I should say if we've seen these uh, films like The Godfather, whatever. Yes, like, yeah, I was just about to say if you've ever seen um, Donnie Brasco, a friend of our, a friend of mine, a friend of ours. You yeah. know, it's you know, it's two different things. You know, yeah. <laughs> and, and that and that Italian accent just fucking came out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but as far as I know, like like in the mafia, like he was not like I, mean, I think when you're officially like you you're, you're considered a made man. But I don't think he was ever that deep. Like he was just like he was just probably just doing like maybe side jobs like that because no, you know, he, sure he needed the cash. Was, he needed the money, and his uncle, you know, he knew what his uncle did, and he said, "Hey, I need, I need this. I need something. Can you help me?" And he provided him with, with work, well, illegal or not. You know, we. I'm not here to judge. You know, I. I'm the type of person is I kind of don't care where the money comes from or how you got the money. You know. I ask no questions as long as that bunny's in my pocket. I'm, you know, <laughs> of that type of person. So I'm, I'm not here to judge whether it was illegal or what he doing was right. But um, they talk about how Dino was um, naive mm-hmm. and imposing, but he was used that in, as an enforcer. And he, re- but because he was so strong he, and he had no fear, he felt untouchable. He felt like nothing can happen to him, and oftentimes. Um, especially when you're hanging or when, when you're around that type of crowd, when you're around that type of environment, those type of people, that is not, um, a, a feeling you should have of being untouchable because in, in, in that, in that lifestyle, everybody is touchable. I mean, history t- t- shows like if, um, f- from, uh, crime boss to, to the guy just coming into, uh, and the books just opened, you know, uh, anybody can, Hap- anything can happen to any any one of them, you know. So for him to have that feeling of nothing can happen, that right there, it, it, off the bat, was scary to me when they mentioned that because like oh, like as I I looked over to to my partner and I said, oh, all right, I, I kind of see where this one's going now, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Probably you know though, Vic Catrani died nine years before Dino did, but maybe Catrani's brother was in charge. But it, but but whatever the case, the mafia knew knew of the of the relation because. Vic was the founding member, and then they knew that you know Dino was his it was, nephew. So it was it was his son actually. Oh, it was his son. Okay. Yes, his son was actually a, a, a wrestler in the thirties. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you know he recruits like you know what? Yeah, your family, so we trust you. But oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I meant to say Vic Catroni was a wrestler in the thirties. Yeah. His, his son is uh was the boss at at the time that um Dino Bravo had had started um. Hanging around with them. Yeah. So by the time you know, by the by the time Dino re- retires from wrestling, uh, uh, Vic Catrani's son is is now the godfather of that family, or however you describe it. Um, yeah. But you mentioned like he was an enforcer, so that that has me thinking. If he was if he was officially an enforcer, usually they don't give. I mean, I mean, I don't know much about the the world of the mafia, but based on, on some of the research I've done since I've seen those gangster films, it has me so interesting. Like to be an enforcer, I think you have to be a made man. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, some, some, I mean, that's in America. I mean, that, that, this is in Canada. I mean, maybe the mafias in Canada run differently. I well, don't know. It's funny, that, it's funny that you say that. Cause me and my partner were talking about it last night and I, I said the same thing. I said, I don't know. It's, um, you know, how, you know, the Italian mafia here and here in the United States works, you know, you kind of, you know, I kind of have an idea, you know, um, you know, based on, on I myself and a, I'm a huge, like uh, mafia movie guy. I, I'm, I did a lot of um, research reports on in, in high school and middle school on the mafia. I've, I've always been kind of interested in that. So I was telling you, it's kind of like, you know, you, you don't just pick up some guy off the street. You know, you, no. you, you're not, you know, you have to be in with them. And he said, well, maybe, you know, the way they run it in Canada is different. So I, I just think it's funny that, that you had brought that up. I mean, that, that, that's just, you know, that, that's just a thought, really. I mean, like I said, I mean, maybe in Canada things are done differently, but... 
But what, whatever our reason how he got in, whatever the reason, whatever he did, I mean, he was part of it. And him being part of the mafia is just, uh, I mean, at, at first maybe things went okay because, like you said, he thought he was untouchable. But then things, something went wrong. And, 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 they, and, they, and they mentioned it. Something went wrong. And then Dino Bravo, and apparently Dino Bravo had, so, had some involvement in what went terribly, terribly wrong. And maybe that's well, why something happened to him. Well, um, if you remember, uh, they said that Dino had, had a bad temper. Um, and he was a massive Habs fan. Um, and he ha- and Habs hated the Nordiques. And they got into a, he had gotten into a fight with a player from the Nordiques at a bar one time because he called him phony. And, he, I mean, he beat the crap out of this guy. And um, I, I, um, I don't really don't know why they brought that up. Um, but it got me thinking maybe that altercation kind of had... Um, Something to do with 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 his that like I'm sure it was a lot of things like that that will that we'll be discussing, but it kind of seems like like maybe he touched the wrong person or, you know like because when the whole mafia thing is you want to keep it local you don't go out there and put it out there you know you don't go go out there and purposely start fights like I know that is definitely a rule is you just don't go out there and 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 fuck with anybody because you don't know who the next man is you don't know what type of heat you could be bringing on to the family mm-hmm. so maybe him beating the crap out of that hockey player kind of started not not saying that's what got him killed but maybe that kind of was like his first warning like dude you need to calm down you you can't just go around beating people up because you're mad someone called you phony you know like, like in other words, you're saying is maybe that was the first strike and that he brought in some unwanted attention. Exactly. Yeah, but, but you know, and by the way, folks, the the Nordiques, uh, they're now known as the Colorado Avalanche. Uh, they were in Quebec City, and of course, I mean, two teams in Quebec. Obviously, there's gonna be a huge rivalry. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, he did have a temper. I mean, I mean, it's, it's like any temper for a wrestler. I mean, if if obviously if someone you know, calls you fake, whatever, then obviously that's gonna set him off. But, um, but they mentioned um, there was a. As I mentioned before, Dino was uh, allegedly involved in uh, illegal uh, cigarette smuggling, um, and there was a a raid. Like, like uh, the family had something like in a warehouse, like four hundred thousand dollars worth of the contraband, and I think the police seized it. Yeah, um, Dino Bravo. Okay, so this is where things start getting interesting. Oh, because really? seriously, his, it does. <laughs> his, his his wife. Um, she, well, she she didn't have a good feeling about what was going on and things he was doing and the people that he, he was around. Um, you know, uh, and she had brought up, um, it was, it was dangerous because if you don't know the rules, you are in trouble. Like I, we, we were just talking about before there's rules to this, you know, yes, you, you are a quote unquote gangster. You're a part of a, a, a gang. You're a part of this mafia family, but there are rules and there are laws to that, you know, and maybe Dino didn't know the rules. Uh, well, and something went wrong. Uh, so she was kind of de- uh, fearing for it. And Dino had been, you know, smuggling cigarettes. And he had uh, he had set up, I don't know if he had set up the deal, if he was part of the deal, where they um, had $400,000 worth of contraband in a warehouse that was sitting there for a few days. And it got raided. People got, um, you know, were arrested, and they were talk pretty much trying to put the blame on Dino for for it. And Dino said, "Well, you guys should have gotten it out there the first night, not, you know, not have it sit there for a couple of days." Again, I don't know if this was the cause of of the death, but again, you know, uh, the rules. You don't talk. To, you know, you, you don't sit there and say, well, you guys should have done your job. That, you know, it's it's kind of crossing that, that line of respect. It's like, all right, if someone, you know, someone's blaming you, just just whatever. You you don't talk back to them, though, you know? Mm-hmm. You, and uh, I think maybe maybe that was another strike, you know? Um, but it got raided. And here, this is funny because in this, they they, they kind of give you it you know, piece by piece as it develops. And they talk to the Mountie and they're interviewing the Mountie. And he says that Dino had called him to come see him as soon as he can. 
And those were the last words that he had ever said to him. And what's funny about this is the Mountie and Dino, like we said previously, they weren't really the best of friends. They weren't really that close. For So for Dino to call him out out of the blue and ask him to come see him, you know, it must have meant something. Um, and, and what's funny is uh, the Mountie went the next morning, went to go see him. And at the gas station, um, somebody at the gas station had said, uh, they got your boy. And he looked at the newspaper, and, and there, there it was that it said that he had been murdered with 11 shots to the body and 7 to the head. Um, now, I, understandably, the wife did not really want to talk too much about what happened. You can't blame um, her, really. You know, um, so they tell the story about um, it was around midnight. Uh, when Diane, his wife, had come home with uh, six-year-old Claudia, and they found him dead in his chair. Mm-hmm. Tony was uh, one of the first to know, as they were best friends, and they, they both had their houses built together next door from each other. So Diane ran over there with her daughter, and she was crying, saying that Dino was dead. Uh, Tony didn't believe it at first. He, no way, no way, no way. Um, he was shot 11 times, seven to the head and four to the body. The gun was left by his body and there was no sign of a break in. The door was also left unlocked. So it's kind of, he, like he kind of, it seems like he knew he was, what was happening, what was going to happen to him. And, and that's really, uh, revealing. This is the really revealing part because he had to have known he was something, like he was in deep shit and we're going to, we're going to you know, progress this story as, as the episode did here um, on what could have been. We've already, I've already given my two theories on maybe two straws that, you know, all right, there was two strikes. Um, but it's, it's, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> to that, you know, it's... <laughs> no, I mean, you're, you're killing me, and, and, and I love it, but um, the, everything you're saying is right. You see, and I noticed that they did it while his daughter and wife were gone. Did they yeah. know? Did they know where, they, where, where she was going? Were they waiting for her to be gone so they can they can kill That's... her without her seeing? You know, for, you know, just because you know maybe they were like, okay, well, she doesn't need to see it, or maybe they just didn't want to witness. And and keep in mind, I think they said there was two guns at the scenes: uh, a handgun with a with, with a silencer, and then an assault rifle. Yeah, which which shows that it could have been two. You know, uh, to murderers. You know, and I mean, these the this story like just shocked uh, all of Montreal. Like we said, he was larger than life. He was a hero in Montreal. He was an icon in Montreal. So this was definitely made the headlines. And there was there's no answers. Um, but it seems he was he was scared for his life. Um, and from what the Mountie says. In his opinion, he thinks Dino did something that he wasn't supposed to, and he knew he was he was he was fucked from there. You know, he was screwed. He knew that death was going to come for him. Which has me thinking: Why did he call the Mountie? Now I'm going to put some theories in my own. So why would he call the Mountie and say, "I need I need to see you"? Could it be that maybe number one, he was going to confess what he's been up to, and that you know, my I'm probably about to die. You, whatever, he was probably going to. Fess up to him and say, "Look, I know we were never close, but I've always cared about you. I've always respected you. You need to know the truth." Uh, I, I I was even reading that Bret Hart actually said, like, uh, shortly before before his death, Dino came up to him and said uh, something about he did something wrong that his days were quote uh, n- numbered. But that's just that's just a theory. I mean, that's just you know a, a source that you know whatever. I mean, we we, don't, we, we can't even confirm that story, but well, but that's what I believe. Maybe like the Mountie. He was gonna maybe tell the Mountie this, like you know, uh, this, and just you know, let him know, or maybe he was gonna beg the Mountie, "Can you get me out of Montreal? Can you help me?" I mean, who, who even knows, the even the Mountie doesn't even know because it was what we do know and what the facts are, and I know you love the fact. The fact is, it was definitely a desperation call. Oh yeah, I mean, call. I mean, it, it, it's easy to tell because, like you said, they were not close, and uh, and and, I, and, I, and I'm sure Mountie was thinking out of. All the people he knows, why would why he, the why, fuck why, is he calling? Why me? is he calling me? Like, why would he want me? We're not close. I mean, we're not even. I mean, we're coworkers. I mean, I know him, and that's it. But we're not friends. 
So yeah, yeah. That th- that that's the um. Should I say? I mean, um. Th- well, the police. That's the, the th- that's police... the exclamation point. That's th- that's dead giveaway. I should say that that's the dead giveaway of the fact that it's a desperation act, act of desperation. He he called well, for somebody uh, that he doesn't know that he's not close to. Well, like like you said, the, they discovered seventeen bullet casings from two different firearms. One was a machine gun, and. Uh, this led people to think that there were two assassins. And they're, they're kind of tying this to organized crime because um, two people who had lived near Dino were killed nine months and four months before his murder. And they had ties to the mafia and cigarette smuggling. And at the time the, um, that the uh, police were searching the house, as they would normally do in an investigation, $55,000... And contraband cigarettes were found in the house um, three days after his death. And the investigators feel the death was over the money that was in the house. And that is uh, more than enough money for someone that they killed over, especially in the mafia. Um, you know, so that's that when if he was taking money or maybe hiding out the money and stashing the cigarettes and the money for himself, maybe... That's what he was doing. I mean, I there's just so many theories out there, Alex. I mean, if he was doing that, that's called stealing from the mafia, and the mafia does not take kindly to that. You do again, not, you do not steal from the mafia. I mean, again, it seems like it's been strike after yeah. strike after strike after strike. Because, I mean, I don't know any. Uh, okay, I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm gonna have to edit that this one out. <laughs> um, <laughs> from the movies that I have seen. Um, <laughs> Let's put it the legal way. From the movies that I that I have seen, um, you would not um stash your illegal work at home. You know, it's not unless you were planning on holding that out for yourself. That's not something you 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 you, you keep that for. Oh, you your your mafia life. You know your you, that lifestyle and your 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 home lifestyle is. You know, you keep that apart. You don't. You don't bring that home with you. So, the, so when they said that they found it in his house, the fifty-five thousand dollars and the cigarettes, that kind of got me thinking. Like, I've that's kind of fishy because you, you wouldn't bring that home with you. No, that's definitely not something you want your wife looking through. That's not something you want your daughter accidentally looking through or anyone that you know. So that 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 definitely uh. Made, made me, you know, think a little bit like, hmm, but what was his intentions here? You see, more what ifs. Uh, and as I, I've said it numerous times, this whole documentary just brings what if after what if after what if after what if. And this is just more like, why was why was the contraband of the money in his house? Maybe, did he steal it or maybe was he just illegally, hold, maybe he was just like holding it in his house, whatever. Whatever it was, it got him killed. I mean... And remember how you mentioned like fifty five thousand dollars is enough to get you killed? I'm like, honestly, I mean, I don't even know whatever, <laughs> whatever. I mean, bottom line is, if you steal whatever, I mean, they'll kill you anyway. But uh, but that does have my head scratching because this has this has me thinking: Did he steal that contraband from the from their one of their warehouses and keep it for himself? Because if he did, I mean, that's a big no no. And steal, well, stealing money and the contraband that, that, that how they operate that those are if two you remember, huge things. If you remember um this is something that, that really stuck in my head he had a meeting at um at a bar with someone that was um that was looking to uh to pretty much share business and this guy was a cocaine dealer um now if there's anything i know about the um quote unquote mafia they do not um deal in drugs they do not associate with drugs i learned that uh, the godfather um so again, another theory here is, was this a side deal on his own? Because remember, the cigarettes are not his. They, they, he's involved with the cigarette smuggling through the mafia. So if he's going and making a side deal, now you know, Alex, you don't make side deals without, without talk, bringing it to the table. You don't. No. So if he was making a side deal with a Coke dealer, was he selling Coke as well? And... Is it because of this side? Uh, could this have been a side deal that they found out about, and they're like, "Well, you're kind of cutting our profits here." Again, 
it, it seems like it, it, he's just kind of breaking all the rules here. I mean, as you mentioned, the first thing he did, the whole thing with the bar fight, if that was the first strike, he started bringing uh, unwanted attention. Mm -hmm. And if he had a habit of that, it got worse and worse and worse. It got to the point where, like, okay, look, we have to get rid of him. He's a liability. We don't deal with that. He needs to be gone. Hey, this is Donna the Playmaker Says. I want to take a moment to thank you guys for listening to us at the Playmakers Podcast. Just to let you know, if you listen to us on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, why don't you go ahead and leave us a review? So I want you to take a look episodes that you listen to which you take other podcasts in general if you listen to you know anchor spotify google Podcasts, our heart radio radio public cast box or any other platforms that we're on you know follow us you know download the episodes let us know any kind of way that you want to let us know whether it's on our facebook page the playmakers Bob podcast or on our twitter page at playmakers stuff just let us know because we enjoy any interacting with you guys and we want to show our appreciation so Follow us, like us, let us know how we're doing, and thank you for listening to the Black Mega Spot Podcast. Does the, does the story end here? No. It no. gets even more interesting because now we bring up the natives, the, the Native Americans, the Indians. They were actually in um, the ones running the, the, the smuggling. Um, and actually, Dino had brought his daughter to them a, a few times, you know, on, you know, on runs. And, he did, and she thought they were just, friend, they were just friends. Um, and the cigarettes, he was selling them by the case for half price. Um, and most of the, most everybody knew he was in the smuggling business because everyone smoked, and no one wanted to pay, pay full price for cigarettes. I mean, I I sold cartons of cigarettes for you know uh, I used to go out to Virginia, pick up like three or four cartons, bring them back to New York, and sell them for seven bucks, and still make a profit. You know, so like I I, I understand you know, and it's everybody knew it, and at that time everybody was like, hey, I'm. <laughs> I'm getting these cigarettes for cheap. Why am I going to open up my mouth? I don't care, you know. Um, so, but he brings up the the the, the natives, and um, from what I know about the natives, I mean, they seem like uh, peaceful people. So I, I don't I don't think that they even had a, a thing to do with with the murder. Then again, I don't know, but the Native American people seem to be a uh, peaceful people. I mean, I'm sure they. Uh, after what they've been through, I'm sure they they aren't the type of people to go and and murder and kill, you know, and pretty much destroy a life. But they 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 they, they did bring up the natives, and it, it was a theory at, 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 that I first struck in my head. But it's like maybe maybe you know I'm thinking too much into that one. I see, and and that's just another what if, more what ifs. We will never know. But what we do know, what we do know, and this is this is, I think this is the big shocker of the episode. Like this was the, uh, this was the climax. Like this was that that punch to the, you know, that that punch to the face to wake you up. You know, um, Rick Martel was the only wrestler that Dino Bravo talked about um, with his role in uh, organized crime, but Rick Martel declined to take part in this series, um, which I can understand. Um, it doesn't matter how many years later, 30, 40, 50 years later, that's, you know, he's kind of a target if he opens up yeah. and if he says things, you know, so I could kind of understand um, him not wanting to take part in this series because this is going, this is a, na uh, on a national television network, you know, that's being viewed uh, by the thousands, you know, um, and I hope one day the millions, you know, because this is a great series, but you know, to go publicly like that, and you don't know who's watching this. You know, I, I so I, I can understand him uh, not taking part. But they did show um, a 2007 interview where he did uh, shed some light on the subject. He said that uh, Dino went to see the Indians. Uh, they were big wrestling fans, and um, Dino pretty much had a monopoly with them. That right there, um, 
kind of ties into my side deal theory. If he's got to do cigarette smuggling with the mafia, and now Rick Martell is saying that he pretty much had a monopoly with the Native Americans, that means he was cutting out the mafia 100%. Mm-hmm. That, 100%, they, that, they're, they'll kill you for that. I mean, they, 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 see, they see that as you know, not only disrespect, but you know, you're, you're selling them out. And they don't, ta- they, don't yeah. ta- they don't take kindly to it. Exactly. You're pretty much taking their business away from them. Um, and they were only able to pass the cigarettes because they had a river pretty much locked down. Uh, and the cigarette business was so great. And, and this is where the story I had previously told. The cigarette business was so great that um, pretty much the cocaine people wanted to get in and get a piece of, of the cigarette action. Um and Mar- Martel said that Dino did to hook up the cocaine guys and had the $400,000 shipment somewhere. When the coke guys went to go pick up the shipment, it was intercepted by RCMP and they, uh, everything was seized. And the blame is getting thrown around $400,000. That's a lot of money. And again, we know that wasn't Dino's money. So again, he definitely was making these deals Without the uh, permission of uh, the higher ups, you know the, the the people running the show there. Um, again, you just, you just don't do that. You don't make side deals. And I'm not trying to justify the mafia, or not. I'm not trying to side with the mafia. I'm just trying to explain that if you get into this lifestyle, you you can't cut them out of a business they brought you in. You know, you don't uh, you you can't make side deals based off of their business without them knowing. And you're working with guys, guys who are dealing cocaine, which is a no-no, a big no-no in the mafia. So it, it's, it, it kind of makes me feel like the, the New Jack episode where it's kind of like, I don't want to justify someone being murdered. I don't want to justify someone being stabbed. And, you know, um, but you kind of know what you're getting into with, 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 with this situation. And... It makes me believe more that he definitely knew he was going to get killed at this point. By the time this four hundred thousand comes into play, he had to have known that that he was he he was done. The, all right, the fifty five thousand he could have got killed for, you know, but but four hundred thousand dollars and the fact that the the uh, the feds were pretty much on it. They knew it was there. And if they knew um, that he was involved, it was either uh, it was uh, it's it's probably over either way, either death or or, or a prison sentence. Exactly. So, so the way to end it is he was cornered, and there was no way out. Pretty much, and like I said, he was sitting in his in his chair with his hand on his remote, watching hockey, doors unlocked. No sign of a struggle. No sign of trying to defend himself. Um, he knew. Like he, and I guess the whole sitting in the couch with the controller watching hockey, I guess maybe that was his way of, I'm going to go out uh, watching something I love. I'm going to go out comfortable, you know? Mm-hmm. And in a really cynic, in a, in a cynical way, in a weird way, it's kind of like, okay, I know I'm going to die, but at least... Let me do this. Let me go out my own way. Not in, uh, that's the wrong words to you. Like, kind of let me go out comfortable. You know, um, I'm in my house, in my chair, watching my favorite sport. No, death is not comfortable. No, being shot uh, fucking multiple times is not comfortable. But it kind of maybe it brought peace to him knowing that, okay, I know I'm going to die. But at least in, in my mind, I can. this is the last thing I'm doing. And that was it. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, you know, so as we get to the end of the episode, um, it's obvious it was it was someone that Dino knew that had murdered him, that had assassinated him. Um, and the, and the theory was going around, or maybe it, that it was the mafia, um, or like I said, the natives, the Native Americans, they probably wouldn't have done it, but. Maybe the the biker gangs he was involved with done it. Again, nobody will ever know. Um, 
Because no one's going to fess up to it. No one's ever going to fess up to it, and that, that's the sad part. Um, it's just always going to be one of those mysteries where we're, we're going to have these theories, and we can try to put these pieces together ourselves, and we're never going to complete this puzzle. Because, unfortunately, one of Montreal's greatest wrestlers, um, you know, sadly had his life taken away. When, at the end of the day, all he was really trying to do was provide for his family after his career had gotten taken away. And that's really the driving point. I don't, I don't, I don't want the driving point of this episode to be that, you know, this, this guy was died and we're, and we're kind of celebrating death or we're trying to... Um, I guess, uh, excuse his, make an excuse for his death. No, no, not at all. But I mean, this, this, all he was really trying to do, whether, whether you agree with his methods of trying to make this money for his family or not, he was just trying to do all he could. And the only other option he had in life other because his career was taken from him. And if you've ever been in that position and then you know what, what he's gone through, you know, um, and at that point, it, it's it really. It, I think that was just the start of it. Is he like once you get into that lifestyle, and again, whether he was actually part of the mafia, whether he was part of the family, um, and I don't mean family. Yes, he was family, but the the mafia family, the the gang, as you want to say. Um, you you. It kind of seems like. The second he got involved with that, he he was doomed. And again, he there was no other option. So it's kind of like either sit at home, be miserable and broke, or at least try to make money for my family, man. It's the it's the difficult life of a professional wrestler, folks. Because once your career ends, you're just dumped out. That's it. They don't take care of you. But on 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 um a positive note here. I, I, well, I don't mean positive, but the case is still open. And, and as we've seen from last week's episode that we did on Jimmy Snooker, I mean, it could take 20, 30, 40 years for, for someone to bring this to trial. You know, it took 30 years for the Nancy Argentino case to come to finally come to trial. So they, if this case is still open, who knows? Maybe, maybe there will be some uh, closure here. You know, maybe maybe we there in some time in the near future, or maybe in ten years, maybe when me and you are no longer here, maybe someone will open up to it. Maybe someone will admit to it. Maybe someone will be tried, and they will be, uh, you know, charged with murder. And then the so case, that then the you know there, there is <laughs> there is there there is that 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 hope that, and I, I at least hope for their for his family that they still have that hope that. Even though it's kind of like it's been this long, it could still be solved, especially with the technology we have now. And who knows? Maybe someone from 27 years ago is really feeling bad. And, you know, it's really like, you know what? It's time to speak up about this. All we can do is hope because the family deserves answers. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, re- I enjoyed uh Talking to you uh, with this episode, Alex, I really did like this one. I think this was probably our longest episode, maybe. Oh, definitely. And this was was very productive because I was able to make so many good points. And, you know, and I was listening to you. I mean, you killed it, Chris. You really did. (laughs) Thank you. You know, I, I can't do this without you. So I I can't take all the credit. And and I'm saying the same thing. I can't do this without you. Uh, We are the Hardy Boys. We are Team (laughs) TV. It is a tag team here. Sometimes I need to come in for that hot tag. Sometimes you need to come in for the hot tag. But you know what? At the end of the day, we double team this. We get the win. And we put it through the table. So before now, before we let you go, next week's episode will be David Schultz and a slap oh, run around I'm, the world. I am looking forward to this one because as a teenager and as a backyard wrestler, and even now, like sometimes I'll watch that video and it, it makes me laugh. Like it's one of those things that, Every time I see it, it never gets old for me. So I'm definitely going to have a good time talking to you about that and giving my opinion on David David Schultz. (laughs) Well, 
Right before we let you go, ladies and gentlemen, I'm like to take a moment to give a shout out to Darnell Salens, aka the Playmaker. He made his yep. return yesterday. He released an episode on the Last Dance. Oh, we all know the documentary on the Chicago Bulls. You know, during their uh, glory days. You know, the '90s. The Last Dance made its debut on Sunday on ESPN, and the documentary is about arguably one of the greatest sports di- dynasties, final championship run. And it's about the 1997 and 1998 Chicago Bulls. Yes, and, definitely check that out. Yes. Um, you and, know, uh, without Darnell, we wouldn't be here uh, doing this. On oh, no, absolutely Friday. not. So, you know, big shout out. And I'm glad he's coming back. Yeah, he's back to podcasting, man. Um, mm-hmm. He's, you know, uh, he's kind of been out, out of it. And he's been more doing the producing and the production and helping us with this show. So it's, it's nice to have him back on and. Having more content, man, because, you know, um, I don't know how many people out there do listen to the other podcasts. We are involved in You have your uh, Bear of Texas podcast. Darnell has The Last Stand. He has Playmaker's blog. Me and you collectively have this dark side of the podcast. Um, I have Motley Mondays, which is um, our 80s rock radio show. Must um, listen, folks, by the way. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, and which is under Pipe Bomb Radio, which is. Um, a great friend of mine, uh, Ricky, the president, Ricky Litwin- Litwinkowicz. Um, I've, I've known him. He's actually known me since I was a baby. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, we're we're all this collective unit. Yes, we may be different names and under different brands, but we're this collective family. And all we really want to do is for us to really boost each other's content and boost each other's shows and then come together because really without all of us in these moving parts, none of this is possible. You know, like the same people that listen to Motley Mondays, they know about uh, Dark Side of the Podcast because of Motley Mondays and Pipe Bomb Radio and, you know, Dark Side of the Podcast knows about The Last Dance, you know, uh, um, you know, so it's really, we really have to keep pushing each other and I can't stress it enough. Like it really is, um, Hard and it's something I was talking to Ricky about the other day. Uh, it really is hard to do this, you know. Um, to really it, it, the amount of hours and the work throughout the week that goes into putting on the show, whether it's live or recorded, I mean, it, it's you know, it's a lot of work. It's it's not just hey, I'm gonna put my mic on and and we're gonna record. No, like oh, no. me, you, me and you have to do research. Oh. Um, Ricky, when he's doing pipe on radio, he has to. Play songs. He has to try to remember him and play songs uh, and make sure he didn't play them already. He has to make sure it's going to be songs that everyone's going to hear. Um, he has to also remember to make so- make time for requests, which is hard to do on live when you have a set list. And, you know, we always, uh, you know, have to put over, you know, um, the channels we're on and the people that are helping us build. And so for you guys to, to listen and tune in, man, is it really is um, important. That, that, you know, all, all of our friends and family and our peers tune in because without them, we're, we're not able to do this. We're not going to be able to keep putting out content and keep putting out new episodes. And, you know, it's really, you know, it really gets, gets, um, gets me and Ricky down sometimes, you know, when we look at the numbers and we're like, okay, last week we had this and this week it, it's kind of not that. And, you know, we know where the listens are coming from and we know, so it's kind of like just, you know, we really need you guys to just put in an effort to, to listen to all of our stuff. If you listen to dark side of the podcast, listen to the last dance. I'm actually going to check out the last dance right, <laughs> right after this. Um, check out pipe bomb radio. Uh, he does, a, um, pretty three days a week. We, he does, pipe bomb radio i do motley mondays every monday i mean it's and it's not the same you're no show no one show is going to be the same so i just really wanted to uh, express my feelings on that to you the listeners because you really are what makes and break us breaks us you know um and without you guys, like this, this really isn't possible. And we're kind, of, we do this for you guys, you know. During this, this the whole reason I wanted to podcast is during this time, this um, quote unquote pandemic that we're in, um, that uh, me and Rick like to call a Steve Carino virus. Uh, I feel uh, people need entertainment. People need something to 
take their minds off the bullshit that we're all going through. Amen. So, and you know, that's why it's like, okay, I want to do eighties rock because eighties rock is just so, you know, feel good. And it, it's, it, it puts you in that, in that good mood, man. And then, uh, and then you came to me with dark side of the podcast and it's like, you know what? Uh, what if it, we did a different spin on it where you had, we had the sport it, where yes, they do their show. They, um, Vice has the show dark side of the ring, but we kind of have our own little spin on it, you know, cause we're taking the facts that they have built and kind of building our own, uh, our own theories on it, you know? So no, no one podcast from either of us is going to be the same so just go out your way to check out them all um we just want to entertain you guys and if it's for an hour a half an hour each day if we could just make you forget about all your worries that's all we want to do man and i I guess that that's what i want to leave this off with man i think that's a nice i I think that's a nice way to leave this off well folks your loyalty is greatly appreciated teamwork is key y'all and please Tune in for Darnell's return episode because just like me, Darnell tells the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And the same thing goes for Chris. We are committed to giving you guys a story and we will not tell lies. Y'all have a good night. We'll see y'all next week.